we're live. General Hodges, thank you so much for uh, for making the time to come on. Uh, I, I thought that our conversation today is especially valuable because many Ukrainians, like myself, were asking questions beyond official uh, statements of you know American aid and, and what what's going on. What is, what are some of the motivations? So I was hoping to ask you questions. Some from what I'm asking, some of what my audience um, is asking, and, and many Ukrainians uh, about you know American policy and about the aid and, and everything. So uh, I wanted to start with um, you. Seem to be one one of the few people who believed in potential of Ukraine from from the very beginning. Everybody made a mistake, but but you, you were uh, you were saying that Ukraine has a potential to win if we do this and this and this. What do you think gave you that confidence? Well, I think three things. Uh, first of all, I had some experience um, with Ukrainian soldiers and officers and uh, Ukrainian uh, friends over the last several years. Um, so I, I, I felt like uh, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, but uh, I had met enough really good, high quality people um, that I had confidence that they would have the will to fight, that they would uh, that they would solve problems, that there was a resilience. That was the, the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing was that, um, you know, I was in the army for a long time. And so I have some sense of of logistics and, and what's required, and um, and you know when I was looking at the uh, the fact that Ukraine is defending its own country, and almost all of the West immediately said that we want to help Ukraine, whereas mm-hmm. Russia um, had a very weak logistics system. What they're having to do now that their logistics system was not even designed for it. So, in other words, the first two reasons are we know from history that war is a test of will and it's a test of logistics. And Ukraine has the, uh, the advantage in both of those. And the, the third thing, in the very early days when I had just been in Kiev like 10 days in the first week of February. So it was fresh in my mind. And when I'm hearing that, you know, the Russians with 100 whatever thousand are going to capture Kiev in three days, I said, that's impossible. I mean, this is a gigantic city. They they could yeah. not have captured Kiev in three days if there were no Ukrainian soldiers. I mean, it's, it, it just made no sense. And so that's why I, those are the kind of my reasons. Mm. A lot of uh, a lot of analysts and and uh, Western leaders seem to have a bloated version of what Russian might and potential is militarily, which a lot of them are, are coming around or say, well. It turns out not. How do you think the perception of, of Western leaders and 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 the and the public changed of of Russian army? Do you think it was a part partly propaganda they were broadcasting were so strong? Uh, so, how do you think that uh, perception changed? Yeah, I've I've tried to figure out how could I have been so wrong. I mean, I was a NATO land command commander, and then commander U.S. Army Europe. So I mean, I was watching all this. And, uh, and I tried to figure out how could I have been so wrong. And I think there's there's three reasons, three big reasons why I was wrong. Number one, I failed to appreciate the depth of corruption inside the, the Russian Ministry of Defense. I assumed always that there was some corruption. I didn't realize how deep-seated it was. And that corruption is manifested with false numbers about how big the military is. Okay, I I doubt that they even ever had even 60% of the numbers that were reported. This is a classic mm-hmm. way wow. for people to skim money as they report they need salaries for 100,000 people when actually they only have 60 or 70,000 and we call these ghost soldiers. But that's a way for people to get money. Um terrible quality of uh, even new equipment, poorly manufactured. You know, we've all been watching pictures of the cheap quality of the helmet, uh, the body armor, the armor on tanks. Um, so this corruption is reflected there. And the, and the failure to be, uh, to take care of equipment that was in storage. You know, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on equipment that's kept in storage just for contingency purposes. 
And all this equipment that I've been seeing of Russian from Russian side being pulled out, it obviously has not been properly maintained. So that's that's number one. I failed to appreciate how deep the corruption is. And of course, if you've got corruption, that is because you have dishonest leaders. There's a, there's no culture of integrity, and that also leads to war crimes. You've got a, a very brutal culture inside the Russian army. Uh, traditionally. That's right. The second thing where I made a big mistake was uh, I had assumed that a lot of the Russian army had operational experience from Georgia, uh, Crimea, Syria, Syria. Donbass, mm-hmm. all these places. Um, and it turns out that only a very, very small part of the military actually had done anything. So, so they had not been doing operations in a combat environment on a large scale. And if you don't do that, then of course um, you make stupid mistakes like this 40 mile convoy on, on one single road, or you're, uh, you, you don't develop the ability to uh, do what we call joint operations with the army and the air force work together or the Navy supports operations. And then finally, the third thing that I got wrong um, if you don't do, if you don't have operational experience, you have to fill in the gap with really good training. And uh, mm. the Russian exercises are not really exercises; they're more like scripted demonstrations. So nobody makes a mistake. Yeah. So you don't learn anything. You can never fix what needs to be fixed. I miss that. Those are very good points, and I, I think that they also were broadcasting that they were showing these uh, images of them testing new ballistic missiles and some submarine drone. I remember when I first moved to to Seattle, I saw in in Queen Anne, which is this you know posh area, I saw posters for Russia Today, and 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 the slogan was like "Get the real news" or something unbiased. And I'm like, how is this possible that 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 they have penetrated so deep into heart of Seattle, even with uh, with the, that kind of messaging. So, uh, with uh, yeah. with them being, um, do you think that you know Putin and military command did not realize how the bad situ- how bad the, sh- the situation was? How did they uh, engage in such a risky affair without having their back covered? Um, I think that the uh, the Kremlin made four big strategic mistakes. Uh, Number one, they believed that they had huge force advantage. They assumed that Ukrainian uh, military was not capable. Uh, They had an inflated sense, uh, you could say arrogant almost, sense of how good they were. Um, And and they really did believe that they would roll into Kiev the way they did Budapest and Prague back during the Cold War. So that was the first big strategic mistake. They overestimated the advantage that they would have um, over uh, Ukraine. The second big strategic mistake that they made was that they thought they would be able to isolate Ukraine from everybody else. Mm -hmm. That because the West had failed to respond in a substantial, meaningful way after Georgia, after Crimea, after Syria, they felt like, you know, Germany, the U.S., you know, nobody's really going to support Ukraine um, sanctions, you know, these kinds of things, support, it won't happen. So that was the second big mistake they made. The third big mistake they made, strategic miscalculation, was uh, that whatever pain they did suffer, it would be worth it because the gain would be so much to destroy Ukraine, to destroy the idea of Ukraine as a state. Um, yeah. and so, okay, so they get a few sanctions, you know, whatever, or maybe they have some casualties, didn't matter. It would, for them, the gain would be worth the pain. And then finally, the fourth strategic error that they made was, uh, or miscalculation was that they thought they would get what we call a two for two for one, destroy Ukraine and break NATO. They thought the NATO would come apart. So this was the mindset Mm. before 24 February. And, uh, you know, I've heard many people say, 
obviously, you know, Putin is making decisions based on bad information. People are not reporting the truth to him. Wait a minute. I thought he was this KGB genius. You know, uh, I, I kept right. hearing for the last few years how he's he's so much smarter than everybody. He's playing chess while we're playing checkers, and he's so mm. smart. Okay, he's been in charge for 20 years. He knows the culture. He knows the system. He knows that Shoigu has a house that's worth, you know, $18 million. Uh, he knows that all of these people are skimming, taking money all up and down. He knows that. And if he really was this genius uh, KGB guy, he, he he would have known this. So I, I think um, he probably uh, did know that there was corruption, but I think he assumed that the corruption was even worse or at least as bad inside Ukraine and that they just, you know, they, they would be able to. Yeah. And what he did not count on was the will of Ukrainian people. Uh, the and to be honest, the will of President Zelensky. You know, to be honest, I am I am surprised by how well President Zelensky had responded to this. I I was really iffy about it, and a couple of days before the war, he was making statements about, you know, when President Biden was warning, he, you know, Putin had made a decision. You should prepare. Zelensky came out and said, "Stop scaring our investors." And I'm like, "Oh, this this is a bad strategy because you should not ignore what American intelligence is saying." But but since since he had he had really stepped up, um, I'm, we're really all, all proud of him. Um, I, I think you know when I talk to my friends uh, from America, a, a lot of them, and 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 some new friends from Europe, since my business had to move, move there now, um, I think what um, what a lot of Westerners are missing is is that they make a mistake of thinking that um, Putin is a rational actor like them, or that he, uh, he thinks like them. He's motivated by economy, by economic factors, but really he's an ideologist. You know, he is, he has this idea that NATO is out to, to get us, even though in 91, when NATO had a perfect chance to pounce, instead they helped Russia get back on, uh, and Ukraine, the, the post-Soviet um, uh, countries to get back uh, um, on our feet, and now that you know they they have some strength again, they they decide that we're mortal enemies again. And uh, my I ideology, my mission in life is to break up that alliance. So now that Putin, do you think that now is is a time when Putin is trying to scramble with a plan? Is there um, is, is there a plan? You know, a lot of people are asking what we're seeing, what we're seeing in. Um, in many city, cities around Ukraine, uh, with the drone strikes and cruise missiles, is this is this panic, or is is there a strategy behind it? So, um, I believe that what the Kremlin is trying to do now is that they know there is no way out. I mean, there there is no way that they can turn this around and defeat Ukraine. Ukraine has achieved irreversible momentum. Um, uh, I would say it's inevitable that Ukraine is going to win, that it's going to restore its sovereignty. How long that takes depends a lot on whether or not the West sticks with Ukraine, delivers everything it, uh, we said we would, and that we keep sanctions in place. So this this is uh, the key. And so the Kremlin, they, they've failed on land operations. The Great Black Sea Fleet is hiding and Ukraine doesn't even have a navy. Uh, the right. Russian Air Force has um, has been reluctant to fly inside Ukraine because Ukrainian air defense has been very successful. And so, what they're doing now, and, and by the way, this this partial mobilization reflects the uh, turmoil and the struggle inside the Kremlin about what to do. I mean, the the idea to do a partial mobilization was Putin not wanting to have to admit that he's lost control, but he's got hard, hardcore right-wing uh, ultra-nationalist superhawks saying we got to do more. And so he throws them a bone and says, all right, we'll do a partial mobilization, which has been a catastrophe. And uh, half a million military-age males left the country. So that tells you right there that people in Russia do not want to do this. They, they don't have a stomach for the fight. And so he's going to use bodies for time. And that's what this is about. Mm. All of this, the drones, the 
putting untrained soldiers into the fight, trading bodies for time, uh, destroying uh, Ukrainian um, power grid to make cities uninhabitable, to create stress in Europe, anxiety, to blow up a pipeline. This is all about to cause, to break the will of Berlin, Paris, London, Washington, uh, Rome. That's, that's the target. Um, if they can, if they can drag this out so that, uh, uh, people get, uh, frustrated or tired or like, why, you know, we have our own problems here. I live in Germany now. Yeah. Uh, of course in the U S we, we have elections coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, the UK, you know, prime minister just resigned today. Um, yeah. so all of these things are going on. The Kremlin knows it. So that's what they're trying to get to is to break our will because they cannot stop Ukraine. I really like what you said uh, in your previous interviews that this is the last winter when Putin can y use the um, energy blackmail. So we're we're close. Yeah. Right? The United States, the Europe is much closer to winning that battle than we think. For sure. And look, and that was Gary Kasparov, his phrase. Um, I took it from an interview he did with uh, Die Welt. And he said, uh, yes, it's going to be expensive. Of course it is. But that's money. And Ukrainians are paying in blood. And this is the last winter that Russia is going to be able to disrupt our economies because they played the gas card too early. And uh, even Germany had time to begin to shift away to find other sources. And they're actually... Yes, it'll be expensive, but they're going to get through this winter. But, um, they have found other sources. And, of course, next year um, will be uh, almost completely off of Russian gas. And so I think this is important when, we, when you try to think strategically. You can't be scared based on what's happening right now. You've got to think longer term. We will get through this winter. Amen. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians are have started to uh, make uh, heads or tails of, of uh, American politics, and uh, because it will impact us directly, you know, with the land lease program just starting and other um, non land lease aid that we're getting. Uh, do you think it's going to be in jeopardy if um, if this election, as as many predict, the Republicans will take the majority? Well. Um I do worry about this a little bit. Of course, the president, the administration will still be in place because this is, these are the midterm elections um, mm -hmm. where the entire, all 435 members of the House and one third of the Senate are up for reelection. Um, and traditionally, no matter who the president is, the party that's not in power or the party that's in power usually loses uh, some seats. Now, this is not a normal year. That may not be the case. I think it's going to be very close, but the odds are that the Republicans would get control of the House of Representatives and that the Democrats will retain control of the Senate. I think that's that seems to be the conventional wisdom right now, but, you know, um, a lot can happen just in the next couple of weeks in these, in these races. And uh, after the Trump election, I quit ever making predictions about how a, uh, <laughs> um, uh, these things are going to turn out. But <clears throat> there, there is, there is talk coming from the democratic side. I mean, the Republican side that, you know, they want to look more closely at where this money's going. Um, so I, I think there's a chance that it will be a little bit more difficult to maintain the same level of support. I don't know that, but mm -hmm. some of the, you know, um, one of the things I'm doing, I'm going to help in in a couple of states where they have a large number of of um, Americans who who come from Central and Eastern Europe. There uh, are Poles, Czechs, Ukrainian, uh, or from Baltic countries, and a lot of these. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of voters actually that have. Ukrainian roots that live in Ohio. Well, the, you know, the, Dem the Republican, J.D. Vance, who's been endorsed by President Trump, former President Trump, has said that we need to get out of Ukraine. 
Well, there's about 400,000 Ukrainian Americans that vote in Ohio. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to help make sure that they're aware that this guy Vance wants to get out of, you stop supporting Ukraine. No. Is that is, is that is that the one who wrote that a uh, book about uh, growing up in Appalachia? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I know him. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that he had all, held that position. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's unbelievable to me that Tucker Carlson and um, and these guys, you know, uh, the so-called party of Reagan, that they use Kremlin talking points. I mean, it's it's incredible, and, and so um, they. they The Russians have gotten to them, and so we we have a yeah. we have a uh, we got to have that fight inside the U.S. as well. I, I was really surprised. You know, I, I'm more of a, on a centrist conservative side myself. I was shocked at, at some of these uh, what what they're saying about you know we have our own our own problems. It's like you know a lot of them don't understand that it doesn't. It's not really a war in Ukraine. It's the war on the West. You know, Ukraine is just the front yes. line. That's exactly right. And, and also, you know, the United States, um, we traditionally have a, um, an isolationist element. I mean, part of the, 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 the good fortune of our geography, a lot of Americans can say, hey, that's, that's over in Europe or that's somewhere else. That's somebody else's problem. And maybe that was true 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. But now, um, you know, the world is so interconnected And America's prosperity is tied directly to Europe's prosperity. The, Europe is our biggest trading partner. And so mm -hmm. um, if, if Europe is not prosperous, then America will suffer. And for Europe to be prosperous, you have to have stability and security. So what's happening in Ukraine affects American business and prosperity as well. And, of course, um, China is watching. And the Chinese are waiting to see if we cannot deal with some economic pressure right now and cannot support Ukraine in defeating Russia, then the Chinese will not be too terribly impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or South China Sea. So this has much bigger implications than just Ukraine. Of course, yeah, it ripples all over the world. It's, it, it's crazy to think about. Um, let me shift a little bit to um, to the American public and, and how they think about it. And of course, um, many uh, everybody I talk to, nearly everybody says, you know, you're doing you, you're you're fighting the good fight, and we'll we'll support anything uh, that uh, that Ukraine you know, wants to do as far as liberating its own territory. At the same time, we're seeing some of the suggestions from you know prominent figures like Elon Musk. Uh, who are saying, well, maybe there is room for a conversation. Maybe we'll give uh, Putin a little bit of territory. Maybe he will stop. And to Ukrainians, it's so obvious that he will not stop. A any kind of um, any kind of compromise will result in us being eaten whole. So, what do you think? What kind of uh, mod motivations or thinking is, it, it goes behind such statements? What, what do you think? Yeah, I uh, of course, Elon Musk is a private citizen and he can say what he wants, but um, it, it really was ill-informed. I mean, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about in this case. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. there are others who do know what they're talking about, at least have the experience, you know, former ambassadors, uh, other people that say, come on, we got to find a way. We need to give Putin an off-ramp. That's the one that drives me crazy the most. You know, why, why do we need to give... Vladimir Putin, an off-ramp. He's got 11 time zones behind him. I mean, he's not cornered. He is 100% doing this, his choice. He can undo it uh, immediately. He could stop it tonight. Um, so to to uh, somehow the burden is on us to find a way out for him to, to get out of this mess by throwing him a bone of, of some piece of Ukraine or let him keep Crimea, Um, all that does is reward um, his uh, terrible uh, aggression and murder of tens of thousands of innocent people. Why would anybody be willing to endorse or support that? Now, part of the reason is, of course, it's uh, and, and by the way, it's important to remember over 70 percent of Americans still support Ukraine and also over 70 percent of Germans 
still support Ukraine. Mm. So here we are towards the end of October, and we're still there. So I'm, I'm optimistic. But the, the thing that, that's causing anxiety, and there are people who talk about, oh, we, got, we have to bring this to a conclusion, getting a negotiated settlement is the key. It's not the key. But what it is, people fear Russia using a nuclear weapon. And the Russians right. know this. Their nuclear weapon really is most effective when they don't use it, just the threat. And that causes people to, to uh, be so anxious when they shouldn't, because I don't believe Russia is going to use a nuclear weapon. It gives them no advantage. They know that the U.S. would have to become involved um, directly if they used a nuclear weapon. And that's the last thing that they want. And so I think people around Putin, they think about life after him. Uh, the general staff is thinking about what the damage would be. And so I'm, I'm skeptical that Russia would actually use any type of nuclear weapon. Well, that, that's great to hear. Uh, and from all I hear, you know, out of the analysts and experts, that that seems to be the case. How would you respond to to many to the one argument that people like Tucker Carlson are, are making, and that professor from Chicago that it's it's NATO's fault that. Putin uh, try, is trying to invade Ukraine because NATO had made a promise to him in the 90s that they were not ex expand to the east, but but they had decided to. So it's it's really a, we made him do this. How would you respond to that? Yeah, of course, this is total, absolute, total bullshit. Um, there is um, the safest part of Russia's border has always been the part that touches NATO. I mean, that's the part. Where they guarantee they're never going to be attacked. Lithuania was never going to attack Russia. Estonia was never going to attack Russia. Uh, Romania, Poland, nobody is ever going to attack Russia. And so, and if you think about 1991, when uh, at, at the end of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia was on its knees. Not one single NATO tank, not one single NATO aircraft, not one NATO single soldier, not one single NATO soldier entered russia zero yeah I mean, if, if there ever was a time that was it and instead what did we do we disarmed ourselves as fast as we could and started pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into russia for business um so that the idea somehow that this is nato's fault is is a absolute that i mean that's the kremlin fairy tale that they need to to uh, to blame and um, I, shame on shame on any well-educated person that uses that as a just as to somehow justify it. And I also I've heard um, educated people say, "Well, come on, Crimea was actually always Russian." No, it wasn't, and not until Catherine the it Great wasn't. took it from the Tartars. And so you know this notion that somehow this was always this. Um, I, I think you know Ukrainians could make a, a much stronger case uh, than could Russia. Yeah. Yeah, Ukraine had had it for longer. That's um, that, that's the case. Um, do you think that Ukrainians, Ukrainian leaders, of course not Zelensky, Zelensky's being very diplomatic. I, I think he's he's the Churchill of this war. He, he's trying to to um, maneuver between sides. Uh, he's doing a good job. But there's others who, within an internal audience, that they're criticizing uh, UN. They're criticizing NATO because uh, because these organizations were created for this situation nato as i understand was created specifically for the threat of of the soviet union and to oppose it militarily but but now it does not seem to have enough will to to actually actively engage uh we're seeing nato countries do this of course uh, and and allies like germany um united states and great britain are are great but but as an organization they're not being as active and the same as un we don't see them a will of going beyond condemnations in their speeches. Do you think there, that there's a case for Ukrainian leaders criticizing or trying to restructure? Well, let, let's leave that question for, for, for later, but is there a case for criticism? Well, I think certainly um, there is a case for criticism. Let's start with the United Nations. I mean, Russia's in the Security Council, a permanent member of the Security Council, and it's threatening to use nuclear weapons. It's murdering innocent people. It's violating international law every hour of every day. I mean, targeting civilian infrastructure. Uh, more than a million Ukrainians have been kidnapped and deported 
uh, half of them are children. This is going on in front of the entire world to see. And, um, you know, the U.N. Uh, seems pretty much powerless to do anything about it. Um, NATO, I'm not willing to accept the criticism that somehow NATO doesn't have will. That's, that's just not true. NATO is a defensive alliance that was, that was designed for the collective security of its members. Okay? Now, of course, I wish that Ukraine was already a member. I believe Ukraine will become a member uh, one of these days. I wish it was a member now. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. But it's not. But it's not, it's not fair or accurate to say that uh, NATO doesn't have will. Um, we, we have made remarkable changes, really starting after 2016. The, uh, the NATO summit at Warsaw was a seminal moment, I think, in the history of NATO in terms of increasing capabilities, increasing readiness, uh, pr- protecting in NATO's eastern flank. Now, Ukrainians might say, well, that, that doesn't do us a lot of good. Um, I would I would I would not agree with that because I think the Russians realize now they have they have awakened NATO, and so um, they are they are going to be I believe they're going to be very careful because um, they they don't want to do something that would I believe they don't want to do something that would turn this into a NATO versus Russia where they would get crushed in very short order. I mean. Because the alliance is so much better prepared now than we were just a few years ago. Now, at some point, I think, um, well, for example, I would like to see us uh, in Ukraine, boots on the ground, helping with logistics, um, planning, delivering, transport of logistics, maintenance, those kinds of things. Uh, I would like to see us uh, providing missile defense protect to protect European civilians from being murdered by Russian weapons. Uh, this, this is where we do deserve criticism. And I think even the administ- the White House, who I think has done a very good job in this case, I think the White House is wrong. They have overestimated the risk of, of a Russian escalation. And because of that, they're, re- they're reluctant to say, we want Ukraine to win. They, they don't say the win word. You know, they talk about we want Russia to lose, we don't want Ukraine to lose, but they stop short of saying when. And because of that, they also stop short of providing things like ATACMs or other capabilities that would accelerate Ukraine's victory over Russia. So in that same vein, you know, after Ukrainian victory, and I do believe uh, that we will win, and I like your timetable, by the end of the year we'll get Kherson, and by the next summer we'll be in Crimea. Um, After that has happened, what kind of lessons do we have to take for Ukrainian national security and and then Ukrainian place in in European and world security? How do you think that will, um, will need to be structured in order to avoid wars like this in the future? Well, uh, this goes to readiness and and, uh, and deterrence. And deterrence means you have to have the capability to defend yourself and to inflict real pain on any potential aggressor. You have to demonstrate that you have that capability, and you have to demonstrate that you have the will to use that capability. And that means investing a lot of money into modernizing your defenses, uh, being ready. Think of all the things now, and, and I'm going to be, uh, this is, this is uh, a criticism of, of a country that I love, Ukraine. Ukraine was not ready. I mean, there were a lot of things that were, were being done, but it was not at the level of readiness that it needed to be. Look at everything that Ukraine has done since February, okay? These things should have already been done, Right? I mean, creation of territorial defense force, uh, yeah. uh, modernization of uh, equipment, um, doing doing all the things necessary to be able to defend yourself and making it clear that you're prepared to defend yourself. That's that's now the baseline. That's where you got to get to. Um, but I would also say that the West, we failed uh, to deter. We, we did not. I mean, as I said earlier, the Russians felt like we would not really respond. And so the, you know, once again, the historical lesson that we seem to have to learn over and over and over is that 
we should have responded after Russia invaded Georgia. We didn't. We didn't after Syria. We didn't after Crimea. Not in a meaningful way. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the Russians they they kept they kept going as as we should have we should have known they were going to do that. And and as our allies in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland told us they were going to do, and Romania, and we we failed there. Um, we know we know now that. Um, the requirement for, for air and missile defense is so much bigger than what we thought it was in the past. I mean, we now see that Russia will use multi-million dollar precision weapons against an apartment building. Right. Mm. So, mm -hmm. um, so the requirement for air, missile defense, is, right. So the requirement for missile defense is not just airports, seaports, critical infrastructure. It's also the hundreds of millions of, citizens and and so civilians and so we've got to uh we've got to increase missile defense capability we also have to increase our lo our logistics i mean the amount of ammunition that has been expended over the past eight months dwarfs anything that we did for the past 20 years in iraq and afghanistan and so uh you know, in the U.S. and in other uh, and in European countries, we're all taking a look at how do we uh, increase the production of ammunition, which is an important part of of uh, deterrence. And then finally, I would say um, our societies have got to be more resilient. Fin Finland is the gold standard here. They they really um, people take defense and security seriously. They get on with a regular life. But they, they, it's like they've thought through all the contingencies and they have a preparedness uh, culture so that um, they're not easily confused by what Russia says. I mean, they understand what the threat is. And so they're prepared for it and they still can uh, live a, a normal life. The rest of Europe um, has got to do that. I think that's right. Yeah, we just uh, we just have to be prepared for war. I think a, a lot of uh, a lot of Ukrainians are uh, coming to realization that our independence um, had come in '91, but it's really now that we are fighting for our independence. We've been giving a a, a thirty year um, a, a thirty year lead time, but now it's it's time to defend it. Um, do you think that Ukrainians? W w Actually, that, that's a good question. I think Ukrainians will have to live within the realization or within the mode operandi where we have to be prepared for a conflict with Russia again. Russia will not stop, will it? Yeah. So I, I think, once again, Finland uh, is the model. I was in Helsinki the last three days, so it's fresh in my mind. I had the chance to speak with several uh, Finns and, and take a look at what they're doing. And... Um, you know, they've, they've lived next to uh, Russia for their whole history. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so they have a healthy, a healthy distrust for anything that comes from, that comes from the Kremlin. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't do business with Russians or in the past, or you can't have it at personal level. But in terms of when it comes to security and, and uh, what Russia's doing, the, the fans have a very healthy skepticism. And that's why they have a military that can mobilize 200,000 troops in just a couple of weeks, reservists that are in the field, ready to fight in a very short amount of time. And so I think Ukraine is going to have to adopt a similar model of um, a, a standing military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Special Forces, but also the ability to mobilize very quickly. And, uh, you know, protect yourself against cyber attacks as well as missile attacks. And um, I think there's a, uh, you know, there's a difference between nationalism and patriotism. And, you know, what I see is real patriotism from Ukraine um, and a sense of a, gro a growing sense of a national identity um, that's, right. that's coming out as a, re as a result of this. Um, but I think Ukraine also has got to work more closely with its neighbors, um, Romania, Georgia, Turkey, uh, Bulgaria, Moldova, um, as well as, of course, Poland um, 
and uh, uh, until until it becomes a part of NATO, what can it do before then? Uh, the United States is going to continue to uh, invest in modernization for Ukraine. You know that there's conversations about establishing a three-star headquarters that will be responsible for supporting Ukraine's uh, modernization and training and institution building efforts, military. Uh, I think these kind of things are uh, um, going to, this is going to be an important part moving forward because you're right. Russia will eventually come back. Now, I think the Russian Federation is going to look very different a year from now. I, I don't think what we see now is what we'll see, um, in, in October of 2023. Um, I'll be surprised if Putin is still the president. Um, I don't know. It may, it could be somebody worse. I, I don't, I don't know how that happens, but I think there are so many factors that are pulling like a centrifugal force that are pulling, pulling things apart. Um, that, uh, I, uh, uh I, I can't predict what it'll look like, but we should be prepared for thousands of nuclear weapons, um, energy infrastructure, hundreds of thousands of refugees, perhaps. We need to think about what what would that look like? That's an intriguing thought, and uh, I, I was really encouraged by, by that article, and I believe Putin had referenced it uh, when he was announcing the partial mobilization. Uh, that had really rattled them, and I think the, the reason it resonated so much is because it, it, it's, it's a very likely scenario, and I, I hope to see that happen, um, even though I understand there's problems with what, what, what happens with the, uh, with the nuclear weapons that Russia holds. Um, I share in your you know, desire and hope that uh, Ukraine will become part of NATO soon. What role do you think, what kind of value can Ukraine bring into the NATO organization? Well, first of all, um, you already have the most experienced military in all of Europe um, in terms of actually war fighting. Um, so uh, all of us are paying attention to how Ukraine is doing this. We're learning um, a lot. Uh, my soldiers learned a lot from Ukrainian soldiers when we were training with them in Yavariv back in 2015 and 16. So so from a, 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 a hardened combat skill capability, we are learning um, from from Ukraine. I think the uh, um, you know the Black Sea is such an important part of of, of Europe. It's such an important part of uh, uh, NATO's frontier. Ukraine sits in a place where it can um, help uh, provide much more security. I mean, Romania and Bulgaria are, are are reluctant to do much because Turkey has chosen not to be active on the Black Sea, but instead focus more on the Aegean. And so Russia has not really felt much pressure from anybody else mm -hmm. because of Montreux. Um, you know, the, the U.S. Navy is only able to be there for a short amount of time. And so uh, a, a Ukrainian presence, uh, once, especially once it has regained control of Crimea uh, and it rebuilds its, its naval capabilities, um, that, will, that will change the dynamic uh, in the Black Sea significantly, and it will also then uh, create opportunity for improved economic development from Romania all the way to Georgia, east-west economic corridor. Um, this, this will be one of the positive outcomes of, of Ukraine becoming a member of the alliance. Um, I think also the... Uh, um, The, the geography is important to help keep Russia further away. I mean, you know, Poland wakes up every day worried about what Russia is going to do. Um, I think it's going to change. It's going to change things with Belarus. Um, I, I don't know I, exactly what Belarus is going to do. I seriously doubt that President Lukashenko. Is, is really going to come in on the side of Russia with his army. I mean, I think they have 10 BTGs. That they, they will not last a week. I mean, they will be crushed. They're, they're, they're less competent than Russian forces are. And so, uh, and I don't think they actually want to fight against Ukraine. 
I don't think the soldiers actually want to do that. So <clears throat> Lukashenko yeah. is probably trying to play, continue balancing himself between, you know, receiving support from the Kremlin without having to sacrifice himself. And uh, mm -hmm. and I think the opposition in Belarus would, would see opportunity if the military got involved in this conflict. So this this is another um uh, Geographical factor that I'm that I'm watching because I, I don't know how it's going to turn out yet. I, I thought it was really interesting. I read one of the reports on your website about uh, the Black Sea being sort of the center point for a lot of these communications in uh, within Eastern Europe. Um, that I, I started to look at it differently myself. Um, you know, my last question, uh, since we're running um, to to the end of the our time here, this is a very a hard question for Ukrainians to ask. But uh, one piece of propaganda that had been able to get through to some some of the Ukrainian minds is. Uh, it goes something like <clears throat> that the United States will fight Russia until the last Ukrainian, meaning that uh, that United States is only helping Ukraine enough to uh, to oppose Russia, to stop them, but, but not to push them out. And the United States, there's this master plan that they're trying to wear out Russia and, and defeat them that way. And Ukrainians are asking, well, wh why would not the United States give us uh, enough weapons um, as a whole, at one time, so that we can push them out. Why do we have to dole it out in, in little pieces? How would you respond to that myth, and how would you give some hope to Ukrainians in this regard? Mm. Yeah, I've heard that myself a couple of times, and you know, this is one of those kind of um, catchy sort of lines that uh, people will use without being well informed because it sounds kind of cool. I mean, they used to mm -hmm. say the same thing about Australia, that that, that uh, Great Britain would defend the empire to the last Australian, that they would, you know, depend on uh, countries like that to provide the soldiers to defend the British empire. And I think it's, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's an insult to Ukraine, anybody that says that, because Ukraine is a separate sovereign state. And um, it has its own agency. It is it's it's choosing to defend itself, and it's trying to regain its own sovereign territory. And the United States and many other countries are spending huge amounts of money to help Ukraine do that. Now, um, you know, uh, maybe most people going back to President Bush and then President Obama. They all thought, okay, Russia's not a threat. You know, the real threat's China. So eventually we, we had to come back and realize that European security and stability was essential for our prosperity. Plus, most of our best and most reliable allies are in Europe as well as in Canada and Australia. So uh, the idea, I mean, what a cynical thing that, you know, we're going we're gonna to use Ukraine to wear out Russia I think yeah. is a um, a very um, cynical assessment of what's going on, um, the amount of money that we're spending. And, I mean, we have almost doubled the size of troops that we have in Europe, increased our capabilities in Europe, uh, both for NATO and separate standalone U.S., is, uh, um, I think, testament to how serious we are about helping Ukraine be successful. Um, now the, uh, I think I said it earlier, I disagree with the white house, um, approach, uh, this, um, I would call it almost self deterrence that they're so mm -hmm. concerned about world war three or Russian escalation that they stopped just short of providing things like attackums and other capabilities that I think would bring about a defeat sooner. Uh, yes. which would, which would be in the U.S. That, that would be in our interest to hurry up and, and get this done to defeat Russia so that they can go off and, and fix themselves and Ukraine can, uh, uh, begin to rebuild. Um, there's, um, so that we could in fact focus on the Indo-Pacific region. So it, that cynical sort of idea of defend, uh, fight Russia to the last Ukrainian is, I think, cynical and, and not grounded in any truth. 
I, I completely agree. Uh, many of our uh, political leaders and, and uh, military commanders saying that we would not have been able to resist Russia if it wasn't for American help. And and especially when it was uh, three months ago when HIMARS systems reached Ukraine, it really turned the tide of the war. It helped us go from defending, from being on the defensive to, to go on the offensive. And it's just like with eight machines. So that, that was that was amazing. Yeah. We could not have this done without the United States help. And and we do realize that more than any other country, US, US is investing in, in Ukrainian victory. Uh, General Hodges, I thank you so much for for talking with me and clearing up a, a lot of these points and and giving giving us hope and for all you do um, to advocate Ukrainian cause uh, within within the United States and Europe. Uh, you're uh, our big uh, friend to Ukraine. I thank you for that. Well, thank you. Uh, I am so inspired by the women and men of Ukrainian armed forces, but also members of the RADA, academics, business people. I mean, every day I'm watching like most of the world and you just see these incredible stories that really inspire me. And so people want to do everything we can to help Ukraine be successful. Well, Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Hello, Slava.